Maria Ressa Zia Rappler, uh, what should democracy sound like? An orchestra. An orchestra. I just, over the weekend, I was, uh, I, for the first time in decades, I played in an orchestra and it's amazing. Paco Bell's Canon. Everyone is playing something different, but all together the bows were rising and, and coming down at the same time. And it was beautiful. That, to me, is a democracy. But for an orchestra to play well, it needs a conductor and it also needs a piece of music. Yeah. We kind of know what democracy should be, right? There are times when we almost get it right. Uh, we agree on certain things, like a foundation. The anchor would be, here are the facts, and this is what we want to do with it. And then we have this public space where we discuss and debate. It's been such a long time now. I mean, I feel like I long for the old days because right now uh, we are debating not what to do with the facts, but the facts themselves. And if we can't agree on the facts, then you can't have truth. If you can't have truth, then you don't have trust and you don't have democracy at all. So what is democracy sounding like at the moment? Is it a, a, a cacophonous chaos? Too much noise? I mean, it's absolute chaos because our capacity to both understand and and the worst of human nature right now, right? In terms of what social media has done in the since 2016, I would say 2015, when instant articles came out, what social media has done is uh, to just amplify the lies, lies laced with anger, pounded a million times, and it's manipulated people. It is played to our worst character, our worst human nature, the worst of human nature. And trying to find our way out of this, um, we've, I've watched it destroy the foundations of democracy. And now to go back to what are, what, what are the underpinnings of democracy? To Is, me, that comes back to facts. Maria, you're obviously very familiar with what's happening in the Philippines, but it seems like there's a similar crisis of democracy around the world from Brazil to Venezuela, to Russia, to Poland, to Hungary, to Italy. Is this a global phenomenon? I think what we're seeing is uh, the breakdown of democracy and the accelerant is technology. Because when you pound a lie a million times, it becomes truth. And that, that means you're, that the whole foundation for public discourse um, is gone. And until that's fixed, we're seeing it not just in the Philippines. I, I, I think we're a petri dish because uh, Filipinos are, we spend the most time on the internet globally and we spend the most time on social media globally. So we're this little petri dish, but what's happening there is happening in the United States. It's happening in different parts of Europe. I think, look at 2016, Duterte was elected in May. Brexit happened a month later than you had U.S. elections, Catalonia. I mean, it just keeps going down, right? Um, and it goes down to the impact of social media. In the case of the Philippines, 97% of Filipinos on the internet are on Facebook. So Facebook really is our internet. And if lies laced with anger spread faster than facts, which are inevitably boring, we've always known that, um, how are we going to even get to a place where the ground where we're not on quicksand. You've never had anything, anything like this ever, ever, where nation states, which used to be silos, and we would use the media for each one only in silos, we never had something to cut across all the way. So this was both up until 2015, before instant articles, um, it was empowering to be able to connect in this way. Not everyone, Maria, will be familiar with Instant Articles. What is it? So, um, in 2015, Google came out with uh, a, a kind of technical way that we would be able to take websites that are clunky and put them on your mobile, right? Facebook had its own version of that to try to keep you on its platform. It's called Instant Articles, and it was offered to news groups. And we were one of four news groups in the Philippines. I took all of Rappler and dumped it into Instant Articles because I wanted to see a baseline. And then a few months later, I took it all out. Um, the problem is that making it easier to see the news, your news feed on your news feed, right? 
didn't work because the lies were treated and spread faster than facts. So the erosion of democracy was quick. Um, and we've seen that. So in the Philippines, starting in August 2016, I actually went to Facebook with data and I said, this is really alarming. If you don't do something about this, Trump could win. This is August of 2016. And we all laughed because that didn't seem like it would happen. And then after he won in November, Facebook asked me for the data again. It's, I think this is the biggest game changer. How we deal with this then determines whether the internet can be reclaimed. You, you personally have become a lightning rod, I think, in the Philippines for a lot of this. What's it been like over the, say, since 2015, personally for you? What is it like to, to, to live a life where every time you, you switch on your phone or your computer, you're, you're bombarded with threats and, and, and insult? Uh, at the very beginning. So, <laughs> so understand with Rappler from 2012 to 2016, social media allowed us, it's a startup that was, that used social networks, uh, both in the physical world and in the virtual world. And we grew 100% to 300% every year until President Duterte was elected in May of 2016. And when that happened, all of a sudden, um, it became more difficult to get to the first casualty in the war for truth was exactly how many people were killed in this brutal drug war that began in July of 2016. Um, the UN now estimates at least 27,000 people killed since July 2016. That's huge. That's We've never seen anything like this before, but no one knows exactly how many because the government and the propaganda machine just lie. Right? So. Um, I'm a lightning rod. Um, For you personally, I mean, do you sleep at night? Yeah, absolutely. You know, well, so what happened? We came out with the first, we called it the propaganda series. This is, uh, I had the data by September, by August. I gave it to Facebook. September, I waited because I wanted Facebook to do something about it They or to give me data, right? I got neither. By the end of September, I just said, because we're alpha partners, right? I said, I'm going ahead with the story. You're not giving me a statement. We're moving ahead with it. And then when we came out with a three-part series, I got bombarded immediately. And for the first two weeks, I was in shock. You don't know what it's like until you're the target because no one else sees that kind of exponential pounding. You just pounded. And at the beginning, I was responding, trying to respond, but then you realize they don't want to listen and they don't want to engage. What they want to do is just pound you to silence. So I just started counting. And that's when I realized this is so systematic. It took me two weeks to get my equilibrium. What I did at the beginning was like, I checked my, my facts. I double checked the data. Everything was accurate. But the end goal is to make you doubt yourself. Right? And since I also run a company, I wrote two of the three part propaganda series that we did. So at that point, our managing editor said, came to me and said, maybe you shouldn't be writing these stories because if you're attacked, Rappler is attacked. The new normals were starting and it was bewildering. So how can truth fight back? How do we, we, we fight back in this war against truth? Shine the light. That's the first. Tell people they're being manipulated, which is why, you know, after that, I actually did stop writing for a little while because I needed to understand what was going on. And the only way to understand it is by to looking at the data. And there are too few of us doing that. So the first is we tell people what's happening, but before we can even do that, we need to understand it. And it comes from data. There's not enough. There's not enough of us doing that work first. And two, the data that's available. Social media platforms should be sharing a lot more of this data. Facebook could do a much better job figuring out where the lies are coming from. I think they know. Well, and it's not just Facebook. It? It's not just Facebook. It's Facebook. YouTube, Twitter. Twitter, right? Social media platforms are being manipulated. And one of the things that gets me crazy is when they say misinformation instead of disinformation, right? Yes, normal people are manipulated, but I think like the United States, 15% are very pro-Trump, 15% very against Trump. Let's say they're the extent, right? Same with in the Philippines, anti-Duterte, pro-Duterte. And then here's this huge chunk in the middle that they're fighting over. It's information operations. 
they're at war trying to get your mind. And the end goal of this is to convince you, right, to change the way you think. So is the reason why they're not being particularly helpful because they're making fortunes off this information? Because every time anyone clicks on a story, they make some advertising money? I think it's a combination of both the business model and then the other part is they've never had to actually create these systems. Essentially, what you need is a law enforcement system, the same way we would look at terrorist networks, criminal There's, You know, look, you have law enforcement. For law enforcement of terrorism, you have militaries and the Interpol even mixed in, right? So one of the things that we've done in Rappler is to, we actually have like a, a watch list. These accounts are being groomed for disinformation. We're seeing that these accounts, so we're fact-checking partners of Facebook. Fact-checking is a whack-a-mole game if you're only looking at the content. But once you find the lie, if you look at the networks that spread the lies, that brings you to something. Who else is, who else is trying to expose these networks apart from Rappler? What other companies or organizations do you admire in this area? Graphica is a company in New York. Camille Francois, uh, their head of research and operations, is somebody I worked with when she was still with Jigsaw. Um, and there's uh, the phrase she coined is a phrase we use, patriotic trolling. Online state-sponsored hate that is meant to pound you to silence. It, it aims at targets that are you know, critical of government or perceived to be critical of government. Because I'll say, in my case, I wasn't actually critical. What I was is calling a spade a spade, right? And here's here's the tactics for every country around the world where you see this. Astroturfing on social media. So first bottom-up attacks on social media, that is astroturfing, creating a bandwagon effect, making lies seem like facts, right? Against a target. If you're my target, I'm going to make you seem, you know, you're a woman, Andrew. I'm going to say you're a woman and I'm going to say it so frequently, everyone will believe you're a woman, right? And I then, am a woman. And then after that, after you've softened the ground like fertilizer, then it comes top down from the most powerful man in the nation. In the case of the Philippines, the attacks against Rappler that we are foreign destabilizers or foreign owned, it was astroturfed on social media. And then President Duterte, a year later, July 2017, not just in a press conference, in his State of the Nation address, then goes to say, Rappler, owned by Americans. I'm like, no, Mr. President, that's not true. I immediately tweeted that. Um, but then, five months later, January 2018, all the way until, uh, from January 2018, in 14 months, the Philippine government filed at least 11 cases and investigations against Rappler and me. In a three month period, I had to post bail eight times. And in a five week period, I was arrested twice. This is insane. I've done nothing but be a journalist, but that's the real world impact of this social media warfare. What, could, what are the things that can be done today Immediately. or tomorrow? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So long term education, medium term, maybe media literacy, but in the short term. And there are two things. The only people who actually have the power to act right now are the social media platforms. So we work with Facebook, which is our internet. We work with them. We're both fact-checking partners and we look at the networks that spread this information. How senior uh, are the people at Facebook you're talking to? Have you talked to Zuckerberg or Sandberg about this? I've spoken with Mark Zuckerberg. What should he be doing, Maria? Tell him. Opening up his network so we know who, wh where these lies, where these, where these dishonest networks are beginning. It's far more complicated, but I think the, the main thing is transparency is the new objectivity, right? Journalists were never objective in the first place. Uh, when I replaced, I replaced a very tall six foot two white guy in the Philippines. I'm a five foot two Asian American woman and our reports showed that, right? So that's completely different. You tell, you tell the story from where you stand and we've always known that, right? But now even more, Data is everything. And instead of keeping the data murky and amorphous, being more transparent with it, allowing, allowing greater um, oversight. And I think Facebook is, you know, Facebook has actually said, we want governments to tell us what to do. Scary thought, 
government should not be telling you what to do. Again, they've disrupted. We're truly living in a time of creative destruction. They destroyed the old information ecosystem where news groups were both distributors of facts and gatekeepers to truth. That's gone. Now, and we can't go back. It's, it's impossible to go back. But I think what we can do is help create what this future is going to look like. Help fix the future, in your words, right? Um, and how do we do that? We figure out how we can, for me, it's very simple. How do we take this virus out of the system? Because it is a virus, it's endemic proportions. How do we stop the virus from, from entering the system and spreading even faster? Uh, Maria, you, you, you said that transparency can be the new truth. Um, what about new technologies that guarantee transparency, like blockchain technology? Can, can, can new technologies help, or, or is it going to be just more of the same? I think you have to deal with the here and now, right? So in the here and now, it's broken already. The new technologies, I mean, I'm playing with blockchain. I sit on the civil council, and you know, I look at all the other stuff, and there's nowhere near it, we need to first fix this problem right now. And the people who are in charge of fixing it are also asking for help. So we can keep pummeling them or we can also jump in and help, right? Governments are trying to help and they have different levels of it. I mean, I watched the congressional hearings in 2018 and I was like slapping my face thinking, oh my God, I, I think, so here's my solution, right? Remember post-Holocaust, after World War II, the world came together and said, we need to protect ourselves from the worst of what we can do to each other as people. And they came out economically, they came out with Bretton Woods, they came out with, uh, uh, in terms of NATO, military. Marshall Bretton Plan. Woods, the Marshall Plan, NATO, the UN Declaration of Human Rights. You think that the, the, this, this curse, this, this, this plague of lies um, is as bad a problem as uh, fascism and Absolutely. communism? Absolutely. Because if it's not stemmed, we're headed there, right? And so this is, we've always known information is power. This time shows us that again, right? And if we don't fix this, so here's, how do we solve it? All the people working on the internet, what the heck are the values that guide you? It goes down to that. We have to go back again. What is our UN Declaration of Human Rights? Let's end on the education challenge, which is the biggest <coughs> challenge, and, and, and you put it in the long-term bucket. So you can be more speculative, more blue sky here. What needs to happen on the education front to, 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 to fix democracy for the entire 21st century? What can we do in the long term? So I think, I think Three things. First is we have to actually realize that this technology is literally rewiring our brains, right? It is changing the way we think. It is changing our attention span. It is affecting our psychological makeup. It, there's more different chemicals are called. Facebook is mildly addictive, right? Social media is mildly addictive. You have higher levels of dopamine, which causes addiction to gambling. You have higher levels of and this is a good thing, oxytocin, the love hormone, right? So there's a physical, psychological, physiological effect on your body. So how do we deal with that? Let's start with in the medium term, media literacy requires knowing that this technology on your cell phone has all these impacts. At least we let people know right now, certainly the generation after us, they're different from us. They're, they do this before they blink their eyes, right? They, they react differently. Um, it, how do you put a curriculum together for something like that? I think, okay, blue skying, the internet, the way we determine how it will move from this point in time um, will determine the kind of future that we have. I don't think there's one future there. We've stumbled into this dystopian universe right now. We've stumbled into it collectively as a whole because old power looked away and let the tech people do what they wanted. And the tech people didn't understand global geopolitical power that they've now appended, right? Because this has impact on, on geopolitical balance of power. 
So now these, the tech people are starting to understand old power is starting to understand new power. That doesn't even get us to where education is going to go. I think the teachers, from what I saw in this World Congress, they're afraid of being replaced by machines. Let's, we're not even going to the artificial intelligence. The Shoshana Zuboff wrote a book called Surveillance Capitalism, right? Artificial intelligence knows us better than we know ourselves. Can we head here? I can't even imagine what the future will look like yet because there's so many infinite possibilities and a lot will depend on decisions we make now. Final question. Um, if we destroy democracy as it seems possible, perhaps Which even likely. I think we've done. Um, what will the future sound like? What is the world without democracy sound like? It's a dystopia. A lot of different people have imagined this before. And what does it now- sound like? Too Chaos. much noise, not enough noise. I mean, a dysfunctional orchestra, something screeching. Or does the orchestra just walk off the stage and we're left with nothing? I'll describe it now, right? It's chaos. It's chaos. You, you can't hear the strain. You can't hear the melodies. You can't, um, you can't hear anything that makes sense, right? Um, can we get it to a point when it's really broken? Will it just be one note from a dictator, right? Because the other part is, where is the, where is the swing? So when I first became a reporter in the Philippines, that was 1986. People power was coined in the Philippines, right? And, and I spent my career covering the pendulum, the movement from authoritarian, one-man one style governance towards democracy. That's what I spent 30 years of my career doing. And now at the tail end of my career, Am I seeing the pendulum swing back? It is swinging back because it's an extremely complex world and people want someone to fix it. That's why we're giving power to populist style authoritarian leaders, but they can't fix it. And if we continue this course, then we're going to have decades again of these kind of, are we moving back towards dictatorship? I don't know. But I do know that every time we give too much power to too much power to one man, that's when the violence begins. That's when fascism and tyranny. And this is other people have written a lot about this. Mark, Madeleine Albright wrote about this, right? Um, it's certainly what we're seeing in the Philippines. You know, coupled with this kind of astroturfing on social media is fear because of violence. It's violence and fear that will keep people quiet. And the voice with the loudest megaphone, our most powerful leader, is the voice that wins. Mm -hmm.